good morning everybody can you please uh, give me the message in the chat box if you can see us and listen to us okay great thank you welcome to first webinar of lightweight cipher design challenge professor devdeep agreed to deliver the introductory talk on lightweight cipher thank you professor devdeep uh, before starting webinar i would like to give brief bio of the speaker so uh, devdeep mukhopadhyay is currently a full professor at department of computer science and engineering iit kharagpur at iit he initiated the secure embedded architecture lab seal with a focus on embedded security and side channel prior to this he worked as an associate professor at iit kharagpur visiting scientist at ntu singapore a visiting associate professor at n of nyu Sing uh, shanghai assistant professor at iit madras and the visiting researcher at nyu tandon school of engineering usa he holds phd and ms and btech from iit kharagpur Dr. Mukhopadhyay's research interests are cryptography, hardware security, and VLSI. His books include "Fault Tolerant Architecture for Cryptography and Hardware Security," which is published in Springer, "Cryptography and Network Security" by Magro Magro Hills, "Hardware Security Design Threats and Safeguard," CRC Press, and "Timing Channel Channels in Cryptography" by Springer. He has written more than 150 papers in peer reviewed conference and journals and has collaborated with several indian and foreign organizations he has been uh, in the program committee of several top international conferences and is associate editor of international association of cryptologic cryptology research uh, transaction of chess i triple e transaction on information forensic and security acm transaction on embedding computing system acm journal of emerging technology in computing system journal of hardware and system security journal of cryptographic engineering spinger he has given several invited talks in industry academia including tutorial talks at premier conferences like chess wifs vlsi id Dr. Mukhopadhyay is the recipient of Swaranjal Jan Swarajayanti DST Fellowship 2015-16, Data Security Council uh, of India Award for Cyber Security Education, Young Scientist Award from the Indian National Science Academy, the Young Engineer Award from the Indian National Academy of Engineers, and is a Young Associate of Indian Academy of Science. He was also awarded the Outstanding Young Faculty Fellowship in 2011 from IIT Kharagpur, and is the Techno Inventor Best PhD Award by Indian Semiconductor Association. His recent incubated startup on He has recently incubated a startup on hardware security at IIT Kharagpur. Welcome, uh, Dr. Devdeep Mukhopadhyay, and uh, I hold, I have hand over to you. So thank you very much, Shravani, uh, for this uh, kind introduction. I hope I am audible, and thank you uh, to the entire uh, to you, all of you, DSCI, uh, for arranging this talk. I hope. Uh, that uh, this will be a very interesting uh, session on lightweight cryptography throughout the workshop so with this i would uh, i think we are all set to start the talk so yes. i'll just share my screen and hopefully it works so can you all see my screen yes okay thank you <clears throat> so So in this talk, I will be uh, trying to talk about uh, you know like a, a possible approach to design a lightweight side channel secure block cipher. So and we will see that there are many puzzle pieces. So the and and individually the puzzle pieces might like might look good, uh, which is itself a, a very I would say like a very uh, interesting challenge about how to design those puzzle pieces. But then even more interesting is how do you combine those puzzle pieces. So. we will try to see some aspect of both in the limited time that we have so this is a joint work uh, with several of my uh, former students and collaborators and also present students 
So just to briefly introduce Rajat uh, Sadukan, who is now doing a PhD, then Nilanjan, uh, who is a former postdoc, and uh, then Shikhar Patranovish, Ashrujit Ghoshal, uh, Anirban Chakravarti, Shovik Kole, and Santosh Ghosh. So this is a joint, like a joint work from our laboratory, which we call as a secured embedded architecture lab. As you can see that uh, our focus uh, in this laboratory is to work on both attacks and countermeasures in particular on the aspects of embedded security uh, and side channel attacks and so on. So uh, the agenda for this talk will be uh, split roughly into four parts. Uh, so first I will start with lightweight ciphers or in particular I will be talking about the primitive which is used in lightweight cryptography which is called as block ciphers. And then I will take a look into another very important aspect when you talk about deploying these block ciphers on embedded systems IoT systems, cyber physical systems, and so on, which is because of the physical proximity of the adversary. So this opens uh, Pandora's box to what are called as side channel attacks, which basically works even if your ciphers are mathematically secure. And then I will take talk about an approach that we essentially have been working on, uh, which is to design a lightweight, good design with uh, with less side channel security cost because. If you really want to add your countermeasures on sidechain attacks, then that leads to an exorbitant cost, which even rules out many of the popular lightweight designs. So we will try to see about a possible approach about how we can address this aspect. And finally, the uh, the last missing piece is uh, the diffusion layer, which is a very important uh, aspect of the block cipher design also. So lightweight cipher design is a very challenging topic. I mean, this is a good good example to just before we start to take a look into an uh, example from uh, or a story I would say right from uh, from uh, mythology, which is called as a, as you said a silu and kuribdis, uh, which means it's a classical method in the classical mythology. Silu um, is basically like the uh, horrible six-headed monster. So you can think of that as the adversary. But then the adversary is not at one end. It can be at you know like various ends. For example, in this case, there is a whirlpool, and if the ship, for think of that as a lightweight block cipher, if it tries to kind of go around that, it can fall prey to uh, you know like uh, conventional. Uh, it can like if you want to design a lightweight block cipher which is secured against conventional cryptanalysis, it may fall prey to a side channel attack. And whereas if you want to really design it secured against side chain attacks, then it may fall prey to, to classical cryptanalysis. So it's a real art about how you can design the lightweight block ciphers or lightweight ciphers in general, uh, as we will be seeing uh, during this workshop. So what are lightweight crypto? So, you know, like, um, so we all know that because of the advance, advent of Internet of Things, cyber physical systems, they all need cryptography. And uh, so, 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 so while, you know, like we do not really want to compromise on security, when we talk about lightweight crypto, the first thing that comes to our mind is the constraints of the, of, of the, of the devices on which they are implemented. For example, there is a less area requirement, which you have to meet because your design has to be low cost. And also the, you know, the power consumption of the device has to be low. So this is not a replacement of traditional cryptography, which is, which is typically designed with security as a first uh, objective. But this is really, you know, like trying to say that we do not want to kind of compromise on security, but we want to give good enough or adequate security for the various environments which on which we are considering our design. So, uh, so the motivation of this, as we all know, comes from several uh, pervasive computing which are around and uh, it has got very limited resources in the form of less memory footprint, the computing power being limited, there is a power supply shortage and so on. And also, right, but at the same time, we are dealing with sensitive information. Okay, so therefore, we need cryptographic systems. And uh, it turns out that traditional cryptography cannot be used. Like, for example, if you take AES or similar kind of algorithms, or even, you know, like uh, I would say, like the other portfolio ciphers which are there, and try to kind of apply it in these environments, then very often we find that they are not suitable. So, therefore, right, this gives us to this. Uh, domain of what we call as lightweight cryptography and how do you design and so on. So the broad design techniques that are used for designing block ciphers, which, uh, you know, like for such kind of devices, I would say are in three directions. One is you take a trusted algorithm like maybe AES 
and try to think about how miserly you can make its design like how much can you opt how much amount of optimization can you really you know like have in such kind of uh, designs on the other hand right you can also take a well investigated and trusted cipher and you try to modify its the underlying algorithm for example you know like you take aes and you know that the s box in aes is 8 bits out of dimension of 8 cross 8 you try to replace it by maybe a 4 cross 4 s boxes or maybe 2 4 cross 4 s boxes so you try to kind of you know like make its design more compact or maybe less resource intensive by modifying the underlying algorithm of course you need to revisit its cryptanalytic or cryptographic strength and then the third approach which i think is even more interesting is you design a totally new cipher with the goal of having low hardware uh, implementation cost so you will see that uh, uh, with these design approaches there are different versions of lightweight cryptographic algorithms you are being proposed uh, li like previously the, the the size of the secret key was uh, often you would see like was around 80 bits but uh, nowadays people are des uh, desiring you know like 120 bit security even with such kind of uh, constraints so there were also an another approach that people took in order to do these designs is that you try to increase the latency of, or make the you know like the design you know like so uh, like you, you basically you take a small piece of design and then you try to kind of iterate it again and again so that you have got you know like a, a design which essentially works fine but uh, would pro uh, and would take less amount of resource but will at the same time take uh, significantly more amount of clock cycles so a classic example of this is suppose you want to implement aes don't implement all the s boxes in aes simultaneously but have something which is called as a serialized architecture of the aes of the aes cipher so you take a one s box and you try to again and again kind of use it to get your round transformations now in this case you can see that while it probably can reduce the area it can reduce the power but it may have an adverse effect of energy so lightweight is really not light plus weight so you really also you know, although you want to kind of emphasize on the low power, like low low area and also low power but at the same time you also probably do not really want to add very adversely affect the the, the, the throughput of your design so uh, and, on, and on top of that right when you talk about edge devices or when you are talking about you know like the cyber physical endpoint devices then very often you will find out that they are also amenable to physical proximity attacks that means the attacker has got a complete hold of the hardware and will try to for example observe maybe the power consumption or maybe the electromagnetic radiations of the device and from there try to kind of sneak into what is your secret key now this if you really want to counter against this then as you will see during this talk in more details that the overheads are very significant the overheads are huge so really you want to kind of make a good trade off between these aspects so here is a classical example of a lightweight crypto or you know uh, i would say like rather a crypto being deployed on iot devices and it was you know like attacked by what are called as side channel attacks so this paper which was published in IEEE Symposium on Security and Privacy in a group by a group in, in Israel led by Adi Shamir uh, showed that suppose you, you have got this what are called as the home automation systems. So in particular it, it's a Philips Hue lighting system. So Philips Hue lighting systems are basically smart bulbs uh, and uh, really I mean there is a you know like since it's an IoT system there is a mechanism of handling control and command that means you can of course control and command but there is an authentication in place so there is an encryption because you really want to kind of encrypt your credentials when because the con the communication is through a you know like a wireless channel but you also need to authenticate because the, auth the authentication will ensure that you are indeed controlling the bulbs and your neighbor is not controlling the bulb but uh, if you really read into that paper and i will not go into too many details for the sake of time uh, the first thing which the attackers did was took one of these systems and try to get its 128 bit secret key so they use aes in a particular mode of encryption which is called as ccm and uh, they try to get the 128 bit secret key by applying something which is called as a differential power attack or maybe in more uh, like more precisely it's, it's, a, it's a form of differential power attack which is called as correlation power attacks and from there it gets its secret key once it gets its secret key you can update any firmware that you want on the device and you can take a complete control over the device so if you are interested then please read that it's a great read uh, and there are also some nice uh, youtube videos on that 
But what I want to kind of emphasize by this particular example is that when you talk about lightweight cryptography, then the physical security is extremely important, and therefore we need to control take it uh, take into consideration while we are making the, the designs. So likewise, also try to see you know like the overall architecture in AES. So uh, in AES CCM, there are two components, right? One is a block cipher being applied only for encryption, and then there is something which is called as a CBC MAC, which gives you the authenticity and integrity. So let's take a quick look into them. So when we talk about what are called as modes of encryption, that means you know like if you have got a bulk of data that you would like to encrypt, then the most common form of doing this encryption is what what is called as ECB mode or electronic code book. So that means like you take your input and you try uh, and you try to kind of transform it by an encryption, say an AES encryption, and you get the corresponding ciphertext. Now we all know that ECB mode is not really secure, and therefore, right, we go into some more sophisticated modes. For example, the counter mode. So in the counter mode, you the input right is typically a based generated from a counter, as you can see in this slide. Uh, the counter produces inputs like one, two, and so on to ensure that every input is distinct from each other. Now, when you how do, so so in that case, how do you encrypt? Well, you do something like a stream cipher. So you take the plain text and you exhort the output stream of this uh, key uh, of this block cipher, and you get the corresponding cipher texts. So yes, I mean this we have, we have, we have there are you know like theory to back up that the, the corresponding cipher text that you get depending upon the nice properties of the AES algorithm is pretty secure. But at the same time, it while it provides confidentiality, it, it does not provide integrity. For example, if you take this cipher and imagine that Alice and Bob are using this counter mode AES and is doing a communication, it can easily you know like uh, try to kind of modify the cipher text. For example, in this case, say CT1. Such that if you decrypt it, you exactly know that maybe you know like one bit of the plain text has got changed. So that means you note the corresponding cipher text for a change that you introduce into the plain text. So it has got no integrity. So how do you bring in integrity? So well, in order to bring in integrity, one one possible strategy that you can adopt is let me take the cipher text and also provide the hash of the cipher. But then again, you can know that the attacker can change both the cipher and the hash. So therefore, right, what we do in cryptography is develop a primitive which is called as message authentication code. So you take the C, but then again you kind of create this MAC. Often it is constructed by using another form of encryption, and then you get the cipher. But this time you are not using it for you know like confidentiality, but you are ensuring that the attacker is not able to forge this MAC and violate uh, you know and breach the integrity requirement of the system. So there is a very popular MAC, and I will just you know like quickly talk about this, which is called as Galois MAC. So what it does is that it again takes this counter mode of encryption, and now when it provides a cipher text because it wants to give this integrity on the cipher text, applies this MAC generation by doing multiplications in the Galois field. Okay, so for example, in this case, there is a multiplication as you can see with MK2 and so on, and then you basically kind of also authenticate the length of the cipher text and generate this MAC. So the idea is that this MAC gives you a kind of proof that indeed this is the corresponding uh, cipher and it has been generated by the legitimate, uh, you know, like my, my legitimate partner. So, uh, but when you talk about, you know, like uh, so, so, so while this particular, you know, like mode of encryption, I mean, uh, has been extended to something which is uh, which is called as the Galois counter mode, and it is a least recommended block cipher mode. So I will just take a few seconds to explain that. So while the previous uh, you know like mode that we talked about was talking about authentication and encryption but when we talk about lightweight ciphers then there is another uh, you know like uh, suffix that we add to that so it is called as ae which is standing for the authenticated encryption but then this ad stands for auxiliary data and it is also very important to note that why do we need these auxiliary data so imagine that suppose you know like alice and bob are co communicating it can also have several auxiliary information like maybe the ips or the port numbers of the sender as well as the receivers which you are also like to ensure that they are not being tampered with so what you do is you take this auxiliary data as you can see here and you add another uh, layer you can say to this uh, mode uh, to this mac computation and you also kind of bring it inside this uh, you know like the mac computation so there are more details that we can go into but uh, as i will not go to them because uh, the focus of this talk will be on designing this lightweight block ciphers with side channel resistance which are these primitives ek and so on but it is important to keep in mind that these block ciphers in a lightweight uh, cryptographic scenario when we are talking about things like the iot 
Philips Hue Light insistence, as we have seen just now, uh, would like to kind of, you know, like give guarantees of confidentiality, that is encryption, along with authentication. And you would like to typically do that with a single primitive. Okay, so uh, that essentially is one of the, I would say, like the objectives of what are called as AEAD or authenticated encryption with auxiliary data. So now we will take a look into, you know, like uh, the various platforms on which uh, your ciphers are often implemented, because it is a, again a point that I would again like to reiterate that, you know, like when we talk about uh, when we talk about lightweight cryptography, it is extremely important to keep the platform in mind because this essentially is a very platform sensitive uh, subject. So. So the most popular choice for designing lightweight cryptographic systems because of this amenability to mass productions are what are called as application specific integrated circuits or ASICs. But the ASIC chips cannot be reconfigured or modified. And uh, so, so there is another very uh, popular technology which are called as field programmable gate arrays. And nowadays the FPGAs are becoming more and more low cost, low power and so on. So it provides an alternative platform for lightweight applications. So when you try to develop your designs on both ASICs and FP FPGAs, there are different metrics which are often used. For example, when you talk about ASICs, then the metric for area is what is called as gate equivalent. So typically you try to find out how many, say two input NAND gates my design will, you know, like take. Likewise, when you talk about FPGAs, the metric for is, uh, which is very popularly used is what is called as a slice utilization. So slice is basically a, a unit which is uh, there in your FPGA. So the question is like how many amount of such units are you using in your design? Now, along with area, as I said that it is also important to ensure that it has got a reasonable throughput. So it's very often assumed that the lightweight devices are meant to be operating in low frequency, generally less than 100 kilohertz. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the metric for the throughput is the number of data bits mm -hmm. which are getting, in, you know, which are, which, are, which are getting encrypted per second in 100 kilohertz. So now uh, when you talk about, uh, you know, like your various designs, which has been developed over the years on uh, for these block ciphers and it has been developed on ASICs, then uh, so let us try to take a quick look among the existing lightweight block ciphers for ASICs. So here are some examples like I will not read out all of them, but I will just try to kind of mention that they are, you know, like analyzed with respect to these parameters. For, so for example, what is the key size? That is the first parameter probably somebody will ask you for a given block cipher. Then what is the input block size? Then what are the cycles per block? What is the throughput that you get? And finally, what is the gate equivalent of your design? So you can observe that here, out here, then I would like to kind of point out that these two ciphers, for example, like present and Piccolo, which are extremely good examples of lightweight block cipher designs. Uh, so in this case, I show the version with key size of 80 and the block size of 64. And you can see that the gate equivalent is significantly kind of competitive and less compared to many of the other designs that are being shown here. So, uh, so here are some more examples of lightweight block ciphers, which are, uh, which are very recently proposed, like Simon, Speck, and so on. But uh, in this slide, I wanted to show you, you know, how a block cipher is typically made up or, you know, like you can see that uh, typically this is an iterative algorithm. That means you take a round and again and again reapply it. So the S boxes or what are called as substitution boxes in this lightweight block ciphers are typically of dimension of four plus four. And uh, then that is followed by a permutation layer. So many often, you know, like many of the existing lightweight block ciphers use a permutation which is called as bit permutation. So bit permutation, as you can see, can be implemented without any explicit gates. It can be done only by wirings in your hardware circuit. And that is why it is a very popular choice for a lightweight block cipher. So now, uh, you know, like uh, what are the strategies that you would take if you really want to implement a lightweight block cipher? So a survey that we did, we found out that there are four basic strategies we are being used. One, it probably uses an SPN structure with bit permutation. As I said, that a bit permutation can be implemented by simple wiring, so it's a very popular choice. Second, there are some Fistel ciphers. As you know, that this is another way of making block ciphers, which is called as Fistel. And then uh, the F function, which is the nonlinear function that you choose in the Fistel, you choose with less gate equivalence. And then the third criteria is what uh, when you choose the S box, 
you choose an S box with lesser gate equivalence. This is a uh, this is an aspect of uh, you know like a very intensive study where people have looked into various S boxes with good cryptographic merits, but which can be implemented with lesser gate equivalence. And then you would also like to kind of, for example, do your design with lesser registers because registers require, you know, like a significant amount of footprint on the area consumption of your device. So again, if you take all these ciphers that we just now see and you try to find out the various strategies as you can see. So the, for example, present, I would say is a very popular lightweight block cipher, which is based on a structure which is called an SPN, that is substitution permutation network. And the typical design strategies which are used at A and C. So A would stand that it is an SPN structure which uses bit permutation. And it also uses an S box with lesser gate equivalence, very carefully designed S box with dimension of four cross four and which has been designed so that the gate equivalence of the area of the S box is less. So when you talk about FPGS, so, the, so it's, it, it's also important that, and it is also very interesting to see that suppose you take a design which has been crafted for ASICs and you just try to kind of put it on FPGS, you may get quite different results. So then what are FPGS? So FPGS typically are integrated circuits which are designed so that you can actually program your hardware. So typically you take your design and you develop what is called as a bit file and then you dump your bit file into the FPGA and your FPGA starts working at, as a different, you know, like design. So you can kind of program, you can get the advantage of the hardware, but you also have the programmability that you typically get in software designs. So here is how probably an FPGA would look like. In particular, I would like to uh, take your attention towards this, what is called as LUT or which is the lookup table. So you can see this lookup table, for example, in this diagram shows that it can represent any Boolean function which has got four inputs and get, you know, like has got one output. So it doesn't matter about what is the gate equivalence, it will always take one lookup table. So if you take such a hardware, uh, such a platform, and you consider the various S boxes of these lightweight ciphers, like and which are very popular, which are called as present, MIPS, L block, Piccolo, and so on, and see that. When you talk about the gate equivalent of, of these S boxes, then there is a significant difference. Like present takes 28, and maybe the S box for Piccolo takes only 12 gate equivalents. But when you implement on FPGS, all of them take four. Okay, so therefore, right, it is when you talk about FPGA specific designs, you probably need to again relook at the on the on the platform on which you are doing your designs. And more another important difference of designing for FPGS versus ASICs, I would like to say that. You say, suppose you are not using the registers. So as I said that typically when you do your designs and ASICs, then you, you do not use the registers because the registers also has got, you know, like a good amount of footprint on the area consumption of the, of the design. But in, when you talk about FPGS and if you see the structure, then along with the LUT, you always have a register. So if you are using the lookup table and you are not using the registers, then you are using still the slice, which is made of this structure, but you are probably not using your resource in a proper manner. And there are some papers which talks about, you know, like uh, this difference of ASICs with FPGS, which you also need to keep in mind when you're doing your designs on FPGS and prototyping on FPGS. So one of the reasons that I said that, you know, like if suppose the first design has got, you know, like more gates, as you can see, but and the lower part probably has the, the like, the, if I take the equation for Y1, it has got, it can be implemented with three XORs, but Y2 can be implemented with only one XOR. But when you implement on this lookup table structure that I showed, both of them takes one lookup table. Okay. And that is why you get this difference. So then talking about the other, other attack vector, which is also important, which is called as side channel resistance. So that means when you take this design and you kind of prototype it on, an, on, a, on a hardware device and you try to measure the power consumption of the device, what if this power consumption, you know, like leaks information about the secret key? So this is called as side channel attack and therefore we need our designs to be side channel resilient. In fact, in the NIST call for lightweight competition, which was very recently announced, uh, it also mentioned that the ability to provide it easily and at low cost is highly desired. Side channel resistance may be necessary in some applications. So in this regard, I would like to take your attention towards this paper, which was published and it shows, just to quote one of the lines, that the area of a second order, you know, like a S-box of a very popular lightweight cipher, which is called as present, is actually more than that of a second order, which is, you know, like a, uh, level of protection against side chain attacks uh, for, for the for the popular AES algorithm. So as, as you can see, the reason why I kind of showed you this is that when you go from 
AES2 present, the objective is that you want to make your design lightweight. But now what you see here is that uh, although you are making, uh, as we have seen that present is much lightweight compared to AES, if you do not consider side channel protections, but when you bring in side channel protections, it can it, it actually become more costly. Okay, so, so therefore, right, it is also important to understand those primitives, which are not only, you know, like less uh, area intensive or lightweight in that matter, but also when you add, add its countermeasures, it still remains more lightweight. Okay, so therefore, right. I would say that the puzzle pieces to design a lightweight block cipher with security against physical attacks in mind is of course to design the lightweight linear layer and the lightweight uh, S box. But it is also important to know how we can combine these two things. Okay, so so we'll start with uh, our goal being you know like designing a lightweight four cross four S box with side channel resistance. So in order to understand uh, this, uh, so let's you know like it is important to understand what essentially are your requirements of the s box so i probably will not have time to design to go into at length about all the requirements of the s box so there is a youtube link which you can see uh, uh, later on is uh, on probably you know like some of the requirements that are there for good s box design in particular i try to kind of bring in what i would mean as optimal s box or optimal four cross for s box in my talk so there are some objectives that we try to kind of achieve so of course, the S box needs to be bijective. That means it needs to be reversible. It needs to be invertible. It also needs to be have a nonlinearity, and there is a measure of nonlinearity as is given by this equation. Very simply put, it means that suppose I have got a, I, I mean, I want nonlinearity in my block cipher, and the idea would be that what is the measure of good nonlinearity is basically you want to ensure that your the, the truth table of your nonlinear function is significantly distant from all the possible linear approximations that can be there for this Boolean function. And likewise, it also needs to, you know, like we, uh, we have what is called as differential uniformity of four. So differential uniformity of four typically means that you, you try to get a protection against one particular class of cryptanalysis, which is called as differential cryptanalysis. So what you do over here is that you consider equations of this nature. Like suppose your S box or Boolean function has got a function F and therefore you want to say, you know, like find out how many possible values of X would satisfy fx xor with fx xor a is equal to b for a constant a and b you want to find out how many possible values of x will satisfy this equation so differential uniformity ensures that if the maximum value of this what or maximum value of the cardinality of this set is 4 so that means not more than four x values will be satisfying this equation now this is very important from you know like securing your total cipher against what are called as differential cryptanalysis and uh, it's a very important requirement for designing your cipher. So this brings me to the second part of my talk uh, with this background is, you know, like to try to understand what are side channel attacks. So in particular, I would like to kind of mention that strong cryptographic algorithms are just the beginning. So you may take a nice mathematically constructed cipher and if you kind of implement maybe on your smart card and while your inputs and outputs are being exchanged, the mathematical guarantee of the cipher gives you guarantees against attacks but in real life the power consumption of the device can leak your secret key so you do not really want to end up in having a cipher implementation which is which can be attacked in a such a simple manner so therefore right if you really want to understand and safeguard against this you need to understand what are side channels so typically these are covert channels which leak information which the designers of the cryptographic algorithms did not consider many often it can come up you know like because of an optimization or maybe a code that you have in your design where there is a dependence on the secret key so in order to understand how these attacks work we have you know like a complete laboratory set up at iit kgp so here is a representation of that so you can see that your design probably works over in on this fpga or on this acid board then there is an oscilloscope which is measuring the power consumption of the device and then there is a pc which is sending input packets and is observing the output uh, of the cipher and along with it it is also observing the power consumption of this device now this extra information of the power consumption can trivially leak the key okay so here is our here are some snapshots of the setup so why does this attacks work well these attacks work because of two reasons one because the power consumption of the device depends upon the underlying operation whether you are doing a specific operation in the s box or in the mixed column or you know the diffusion layer of your of your cipher the power consumption will be different and that probably can have a bearance on what is called what are called as simple power attacks 
even more important point number 2 is that the power consumption of the of the operations can be also you know like dependent upon the underlying data on which you are doing your processes that means like the if i can measure the power consumption then i may know you know like in your internal data points which can be utilized to get the secret key so here is a trace uh, of for example the aes algorithm as you can see that there are nice 10 deep points and if you go into one of them you can see the underlying structure of so, so these variations are what essentially cause the various forms of power attacks but how do you really exploit them i probably will not have time to go into details again there is a youtube link below if you are interested you can go and see the working of this attack uh, very simply put this power uh, this technique works because when you are measuring the power consumption you can actually correlate the power consumption with something which is called as the hypothetical power consumption now this hypothetical power consumption how do you get it you get it by using some kind of power models which are there in your uh, which are there which are prevalent for example the simplest power model could be the hamming weight of your you know the bytes in your cipher for example like that means you are say counting the number of ones which are there in the in a particular byte and that will give you a measure of the power consumption but how do you get that uh, you know like the internal byte you make a guess of the secret key so the idea is that if you find that there is a very strong correlation between your hypothetical power consumption and the actual power consumption then you probably suspect that your guess for the secret key was correct that is why you distinguish your wrong keys from the correct key and you try to get the secret key okay so these forms of attacks are what are called as differential power attacks or correlation power attacks and are extremely a potent attack vector so what we will try to more you know like understand in today's presentation is how do you make your cipher secure against it okay so the most popular technique of doing so is what is called as masking so you try to develop your masking so in a manner manner so that the internal computations become independent of the actual computation so you try to bring in random uh, values or random masks as they are called and you try to kind of break the correlation of the internal computations with your unmasked data or with your actual data which you are trying to hide so so let us take a look into a mask multiplier so as you can see that what I, what i basically want to do is i want to calculate a into b for example but i do not do it directly so what i do is i bring in some mask parameters like which are denoted here as ma mb mq and so on and then i kind of write my computation in this manner but i do not want to kind of compute on explicitly on directly a and b which are my actual data but i kind of implement it in a slightly different manner so i basically have this exorbitant circuit and i kind of ensure that i am always computing on this on the data like am bm mb and ma each of these are kind of uncorrelated with your actual data a for example so for example if you see uh, this equation like am is being generated as a exorbit with ma so if you really want to hide this information a what you do is you randomly generate this mask ma and you exort a with ma and you calculate am likewise you do it for b so you calculate bm and now you express your computation using am and bm so that your data is always not dependent directly on the secret a on on the secrets a and b so as you can see that if you really want to do this masking then the overhead has increased at least you know like probably for around four times because now rather than having one multiplier you have got four multipliers okay so there is a uh, inherent cost that is coming and it will probably make your design not really lightweight anymore so uh, and more importantly if you try to take a little look uh, deeper look into masking you will see that it is uh, while it is secured against what are called as first order attacks it is not secured against second order attacks so let us try, try to take a quick look into this so for example if my internal data is x and i am trying to hide it by generating masks like x1 and x2 so that means like i want to always ensure that this x is the xor of x1 and x2 and then i will do my computations using x1 and x2 okay in the mask circuit so therefore if i want to kind of mask zero then the mask uh, mask mask values will be zero and zero because zero xor zero is zero likewise right zero can also be masked with one and one because the xor of one and one is also zero so how do you mask one well zero one will work as well as one zero will work because both of them xor will give you one so now suppose you have got a circuit where you are operating only on x1 and x2 so how will you get the leakage due to x1 and x2 the power consumption due to x1 and x2 so here you bring in the power model that i just mentioned so the power model for example is a hamming weight power model you can say, you can approximate the power consumption by maybe the hamming weight of your x1 and x2 tuple 
So in this case, suppose 0, 0 is your tuple. So therefore, the Hamming weight is 0. Likewise, 1, 1. So there are two bits. So you, the Hamming weight is 2. 0, 1, it is 1. 1, 0, it is 1. So now, if you observe the mean power, so the mean power when your x is equal to 0, you can see that the mean power here is uh, 0 and 2. So if we average it, it becomes 1, right? So likewise, uh, you can observe that, uh, you know, like if you, for example, um, so you can observe that, suppose, you know, like, uh, so, so while this is, you know, like 0 and 2, and therefore the average is 1, but in the second case, right, for example, suppose you're, uh, you, you see that the, your leakage values are 1 and 1, so the average is 1. So you can, you can see here that the average power is not really leaking information about whether your x is 0 or whether your x is 1. Both the mean values are same. But if you go into the second order moment, like see the variance, you will see that the variance here is more because you see the values like 0 and 2. So the variance in this case is 1. But in this case, the variance is 0 because it is both in both cases it is 1. So therefore, if you observe the second order, uh, you know, like statistics, then you are able to distinguish still that whether your actual data is 0 and 1. Okay. And that is why your design, when you're talking about like the masking that we saw, it is not secured against what are called as second order attacks. So how do you protect against them? Because of different applications may require that. And therefore, you go into what are called as higher order masking. So in higher order masking, very simply put, you do not operate with maybe, you know, like, so you, depending upon the order of security that you want, you bring in just one more mask compared to that. So if you want security against a dth order adversary, you bring in D plus one masks, okay? And you try to do your computations using them. So now, uh, yeah, I mean, so how you can really, you know, like hide behind the mask? Well, I mean, it's easy to do for linear uh, transformations because the linear transformations are, you know, like, uh, as you can see that if you have got, say, the mask that's X1 to XD plus one, the corresponding mask of the output can be easily obtained because of the property that L is, say, a linear transformation. However, nonlinear transformations are more difficult to mask and therefore, right, the S boxes are really a challenge of how you can really hide them within the mask. So, so let us take an example of a nonlinear transformation. So for example, it is ZXOR with XY and suppose this is my mask circuit. Okay, so if you, this is a mask circuit, you can see that F1 and F2 both are operating on the masks X. So what you do is you take X and maybe mask it as X1, Y1, uh, X1, X2, and then you mask Y as Y1, Y2, and you express your operations in terms of X1 and Y1 and X2 and, and Y1 and Y2. So you can see, of course, that the hardware becomes more complex, but more importantly, there are some subtle points here which you can observe. So in this case, for example, you can see that F2 actually depends upon all the shares. Like for example, F2 depends upon both X1 and X2. So which are both the shares of your uh, of your of your actual data, which is X. And likewise, it also depends upon upon both the masks Y1 and Y2. So therefore, right, this is and more importantly, right, we will see that it is also not secured against, I mean, definitely it is not secured against higher order attacks because somebody who is measuring, you know, like both these points will still get the secret data. And more importantly, it is not actually secured against even first order attacks if there are glitches. So this is an extremely important point to note that why is this design not secured against glitches? So let me try to explain this by introducing this popular model, which is called as the probing model. So in the probing model, we assume that an attacker can observe the values of up to D intermediate wires of your circuit per bit during the computation within a certain time. So the correspondence between the D probing model and the Dth order DPA is basically that, that we are assuming that suppose you have got your design and inside this design, the attacker can observe say D points and uh, still should not be able to get your secret data. Okay, so if it is observing say D data points, this D data point should not reveal information about your secret data. So you are basically assuming that the adversary has got, you know, like the power to observe intermediate points inside your circuit. Now, this is a very realistic and, you know, like I would say a practical assumption because uh, when you're observing the power consumption, the power consumption is actually giving you this ability of observing internal points by the power side channel. And that is essentially abstracted here in this probing model. So now uh, let us try to understand why this circuit would leak uh, when there is a glitch inside your VLSI circuit. So again, let us take this example. So this example is exactly this circuit that we have seen, which is uh, shown over here for F2. And we suppose have got, uh, you know, like a gate level representation of this. 
So now I would take your attention towards, you know, like some of these points here, as you can see that these are my internal points. And I consider, for example, uh, you know, like a toggle input, which is coming to, so you can assume, assume that for many of the microcontrollers on which you are probably implementing your lightweight ciphers, there is something which is called as a pre-charge phase. That means the, you know, the circuit is zeroized and then you do your computation. Okay. So for example, when you are, say, say if you are considering this uh, for the, 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 the data, data points X2, so imagine that initially it is recharged to zero and then at some point of time you, when you are doing your computation it goes to one okay so you are basically going to the one value likewise for y1 and x2 there are some transitions which we have considered imagine that there is no transition for y2 so in this case uh, we just make an assumption that the when 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 the toggle for x2 comes in so suppose this is your toggle for x2 which comes in the toggle for y1 comes a little later okay so that means there is this gap that is between these two toggles he says something which is delta okay so now because of this delta uh, suppose you know like if there is an AND gate which is there in this for these two signals then you can easily understand that uh, because of these two AND gates the resultant output will be like this and this transition will come during uh, this transition will come during this delta time okay time instance but on the other hand if you have got an XOR that means if you have got an exclusive or then uh, you will rather get you know like something like this you will get a kind of glitch like this and the duration of this glitch will be again this delta time unit so now if you with this background right if you see this circuit you will see that again you know you have got these two points so therefore you will get the toggle at the output of the end as we have seen here and uh, if you see for example this point right then there is again a toggle but because of these two toggles now this point will have this glitch which is the output of this XOR and likewise this and since there is no toggle here this glitch will pass to the output so that essentially is, you know, like summarizing what is happening in, say, the last row of this table. Okay, so you can see that in the, if you, the way to read this table is you see that I just give you the logic values after when the computation starts. That means everything is initially zero, but then Y1 goes to logic one. So I have indicated that by one. Y2 doesn't make any transition, so it remains zero. And Y X2 makes a transition from zero to one. And likewise, this point Z2 XOR with X1, Y2 makes a transition from zero to one. Okay. So then what I note over here is the number of transitions for the AND gate before this, uh, this, this time instance delta. So as you can see that in this case, the AND gates never made a transition. The, the first time that the AND gate made a transition was at the time instance delta. So that means before there was no transition. So therefore we indicate that by zero. But after it made a transition, you can see that only this AND makes a transition. In this, uh, the output of this AND does not make any transition. So I indicate that by one, okay? So likewise, if you observe the XOR, so the exclusive OR, for example, you will see that there was one transition here, there was one transition here. So totally there were two transitions before delta. And after delta, again, there is one transition here and one transition here. So they, again, there are two transitions, okay? So likewise, for all these various uh, four bits, you can have 16 possible assignments. So you just populate all the number of potential number of transitions for the AND as well as the exhausts. So now what you do is you just compute the average power that is required for the AND before the transition and after the transition. So here you see that it was all zero. So the average remains at zero. And likewise for this. And uh, for this particular case, you see that there is one, two, and, and again, another two. So totally it is four. So the average would be probably like four by some number. But but in this case, you find that the four is rather, I mean, again, you obtain the sum of four because one plus one plus one plus one is four. So therefore the AND gate, if you take the average power for these two cases, when Y is equal to zero and when Y is equal to one, the average power remains the same. If you consider this or do this same exercise for an XOR, you will see that before the transition, the sum is, you know, like two plus two plus two plus two, that is eight. And likewise, it is eight again. So the XOR uh, in this case is fine. The average power is fine. But what happens after the transition? So after the transition, you see that here there is one and plus one, that is two. But for the, for the case when Y is equal to one, you find that the sum is two plus one, three plus three, that is six. So now you find that the average glitch power for the exit gate is actually dependent upon whether y is equal to zero or y equal to one. Okay. So therefore you see that uh, 
uh, when you are you know like having glitches inside your circuit which is very very common because in your hardware circuit there will be glitches and if somebody has got the ability to measure the power consumption of the device then this glitch power will again manifest itself and leak information about your secret data which is why which you are trying to kind of hide between the masks but still this hiding is not working so in order to secure that uh, therefore people have gone into higher order maskings and so on but more importantly there is a mechanism which is called as threshold implementation or ti so i will just take quickly you know like try to take a look into what it means by a ti so typically for a ti there are different requirements like of course correctness masking non completeness and so on uh, in order to explain that let us take a diagram so what you do typically in a in a threshold implementation is that rather than implementing you know like fx equal to a directly you try to decompose the function into different component functions and you try to kind of decompose decompose your input x also into different shares okay and then you because of these component functions you get different output shares and you, you try to the idea is that if it is correct then when you are composing or when you are combining your output shares you should get back the actual output which is a for example so what i mean is that suppose uh, you know like if you have got your input x and you want to get what is you know like you want to get uh, a which is the output of you know like applying the function f on the input x um, then you really you know like have got different component functions and the, the component functions will give you input will give you outputs like a1 to as and when you combine them that is when you combine these outputs then you should get back the actual data okay so that if it is so then you say that your design is correct of course your design needs to be exactly the same as per your specification but but along with it you also need to give some more guarantees for example the first guarantee that you need to give is what is called as uniform masking so uniform masking i mean typically without going into too much details means that uh, it means that the it basically implies the independence that means uh, the independence of suppose you know like there are say sx amount of shares that means you have decomposed x into say sx shares and that means that if i if the attacker is able to combine you know like any sx minus one shares that means it doesn't you know like just leaves out one of the shares then it should be completely independent of the unmasked data which is x okay so this bears it's uh, you know like roots from what are called as secret sharings and based upon that there is a proof and so on which i will not go into this for the sake of time but i would just like to emphasize that it implies that if the masking is really in uniform then your actual data is actually independent of what is called as xi hat okay so xi hat typically means that it's a vector uh, with you know like so, so suppose you know like you are you are say suppose you you are you are taking x and you are decomposing x into different shares so these shares are denoted as say x1 x2 and so on till say x sx but i just leave out one of the shares okay so if you leave out one of the shares you are again you are completely clueless about what is the value of x okay so it is independent of the of the value of x but then you know like it is not only important that your design is you know like uniform the mask but also there is another requirement which is called as non completeness so non completeness means that if you consider for example the shares f1 and f2 here you see that see that f2 actually depends on all the two shares okay so this is not this is something that we do not want so in a, when we talk about a non complete implementation then that means that the f the any component of f must be independent of at least one input share so that means at least one input share should be left out so with this background the guarantee is that if you really implement a threshold implementation with all these requirements then it should be secured against even you know like attacks even when there are glitches inside your circuit so uh, there are more nuances to this and uh, so here is an example of suppose i take an input like xy and i do a first order sharing with threshold implementation you can see that any of these functions like f1 f2 and f3 or any linear combination of this will always leave out one share for example here you can see that x1 has not been utilized likewise y1 has not been utilized in this uh, particular component function so uh, you know like it is also equally important that suppose i have got a nicely uniformly implemented uh, circuit and i feed it you know like to another circuit then because of the fact that the output may not end like the output right remember that this circuit is now broken up into different components and therefore the output is also masked and it has got different uh, shares 
and uh, it is not only important that your input is masked but your output also should be uniform okay and in order to guarantee that there is a requirement that has been proposed by this lemma which says that when your input is not only uniform but your output is also equally uniform so with these restrictions, you have to make your design. So that is the idea that if you make your designs with these restrictions, then your design should be, you know, like secured against power attacks. Another point that I would like to kind of highlight is that if you have got a function with an algebraic degree of D, that means if you have got terms like x1, x2, x3, so on till D, then at least D plus one shares are required in your implementation. Okay, so this is a very important constraint or I would say thumb rule you need to keep in mind if you want to make a design or I would say like a TI design which is secured against, uh, you know, which is secured against DPA. So, and, and along with it, right, I mean, uh, so let us take a look into a good TI for say an AND gate. So here you can see that XY has been implemented in this. But uh, I, I, you can just take, assume at this point that it has got these nice properties that I mentioned. Uh, but also note that overhead, right? You see that just for an AND gate, there is a significant amount of computation that you need to do. So therefore, the question is, right, how do you make a good design with less side channel security? So uh, let's see, let's side channel security cost. So in order to do that, uh, we basically, uh, we, we try to kind of propose a very, uh, you know, I would say like a beautiful state machine, which is called as a cellular automata. So what is a cellular automator? So cellular automator basically is, a, you know, like, a, 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 I would say like a function, we can think of as a Boolean function, which basically works on something which are called as local rules. So that means, right, it, uh, so I, I'll just take an example to illustrate this. So consider that there is a state, you know, like a state, there is a state where there are in, there are six bits, okay? So the six bits are, say, from here to here, okay? So I just indicate that by, say, zero, zero, so, so suppose, you know, like these are your corresponding shares. Okay. So you can think of these are these, these are your shares. So suppose I want to calculate, you know, like the output here. So I use a, a, a formula, which is given by this function F. Okay. And every cell has got the same formula. So that is the beauty of CA. That means, you know, like it is made of rules, which are local and which are uniform. So for example, I take a very simple rule, say X1, Z, X2, Z, X3. So that means I take say three, three bits like one, zero, zero, and I XOR it, I get zero. Okay, so likewise, I basically just, uh, you know, like get this output by exhorting uh, three inputs. So now, now the question is, right, suppose you want to get the output for this particular cell, how do you get the adjacent cell? So therefore here we bring in a concept which is called as periodicity, which basically is the P in this particular notation. So what we do is you take the, you know, like the neighbors, but you consider this array as a circular array. So therefore, if you bring in one zero here, and if you take an XOR of one, one, and zero, then you get zero. And likewise, for this particular cell, you get you take an XOR of zero, one, and one, you get a zero, and so on. So that is why how you basically compose the next state of this machine. So this is a very popular machine, or at least at one point it was a very popular machine, which basically uses local rules to get the next state. Okay, and it is made of very simple rules for that matter. So now, why do you want to use it for, say, an S-box construction? So, or maybe a four cross four S-box construction. So you see that if you consider a four cross four S-box, so that means typically it has got four outputs. So if you have got, you know, like typically you will see that most of these S-boxes, if you take the, if you write the Boolean functions for each of these S-boxes, like F1 to say F4, you will find out that all of these functions are distinct, okay? And that is why you really cannot serialize this computation, which is required for a lightweight implementation. So in a cellular automata implementation, you can take the same rule, okay? And you can just kind of repeat them. And rather than repeating it, you use the same rule and you just do a cyclic shift of your input, okay? So you just apply a circular uh, shift of your input and you again apply the same function to get the next bit, for example. So you can actually have a very nice serialized architecture with less area footprint, and you can get the required amount of uh, security. So in our investigation, we found that we actually were able to get optimal implementation for cross for s box by studying various such kind of CA configurations. And we finally found out that 512 such uh, transformations were optimal. So optimal means, as I said, that uh, the requirements at the beginning. So, so likewise, you know, like, uh, but, but you also need to ensure that they are really, you know, like miser in terms of area and power. So we did an analysis in particular, we tried to com uh, combine or I would say group the rules into 12 classes, 
each class being indicated by this number like 1, 2 and 2. So what is 1 means that if you take the algebraic normal form of this Boolean function, then there are one, there is one cubic term and if you see 2 then that means this is the number of quad quadratic terms and then these are the number of linear terms. So we found out that typically there is a thumb rule and there is a gradation in terms of their area cost. So typically uh, you will see that uh, there is a, you know, like a way of understanding. So suppose, you know, like uh, if, for example, if I consider 1, 2, 2 and 1, 3, 1, then if the number of cubic terms are same, then I would probably anticipate that, that the cost of implementing them will be roughly the same. Okay, but if I consider something and compare it with maybe these, well, these functions, then since there is a significant increase in the number of cubic terms, the cost of implementing these Boolean functions will be much more than implementing these Boolean functions. So with this background, right, we created a direct mask implementation. As you can see that all of these has probably, uh, you know, like an, has got an algebraic degree of three. So therefore by our thumb rule, we need three plus one, that is four degree masking. And this is how your direct mask implementation works. So here are some, you know, like uh, quick uh, representations of how your uh, area stands compared to the other very popular uh, S boxes. As you can see that there is a, a reduction in terms of the area as well as the dynamic power consumption compared to the other designs uh, because of this uh, use of CA. And uh, in particular, if you really want, so we can reuse this further. So there's a trick that you can adopt to implement the TI. You can take this function and you can decompose into smaller functions where the algebraic degree is less. For example, here the algebraic degree is three, but you can decompose it into sub Boolean functions where the algebraic degrees are, are, are two. And then as you know that for implementing a TI implementation with algebraic degree two, you need two plus one, that is three shares. And therefore, rather than having one direct mask implementation, you can have two composite layers of a TI implementation. So likewise, this is another TI class that we show here. And this is the overall architecture for developing this S box. As you can see that this is the first layer, this is the second layer, and both of them uses uh, three sharings. Okay, so you can see that there are three sharings being used, and you can compare it with the direct mask architecture where there where there was uh, where there were four shares that were used. Now four shares is much more costly compared to a three shared implementation, and that you can see in the results. So for example, here you can see that now the cost is even further less. In fact, if you compare this S box with maybe the present S box, you see almost a 50% reduction in terms of the resource and likewise in the power consumption. So then if you really want to evaluate your design with respect to power attacks, there is a very popular test, which is called as test vector leakage assessment, which you can adopt. And the idea is that you do this TVLA test. I will not go into details how to do the TVLA test. There are many resources. The idea is that this TVL evaluation should always be between this range of minus 4.5 to plus 4.5, which if it is so, then you believe that your design is secured against power attacks. And finally, to conclude, how will you make, you know, like, so this is, this was one piece of your design. The other piece would be the corresponding diffusion layer. So that is the missing piece. And uh, I will rather like to point out about, you know, like a cipher that uh, we tried to construct using this S box with a bit permutation layer. As I say that a bit permutation layer is always very coveted because it has zero resource to implement. But this cipher, which we called as trifle, was a failed attempt. Okay, so let me show you why it is a failed attempt. In particular, you can make your trivial architecture and we did a comp you know, like complete TV analysis of that. And it shows that our side channel guarantees are fine, you know, like and they're, they're, this design is well protected against power attacks. But then if you really want to go into the details about this, you will see that the S box that we had had one bad point, which is that the branch number is two. So what is a branch number? Very quickly speaking, if you take this S box and if you disturb, you know, like say one bit here, then in the output, you know, like there's a, there's a chance that you will get only one bit being getting affected. Okay. And because of that, you can find out a very bad property in this cipher construction where only one bit has got affected in the output there is one bit got affected and because of the bit permutation this affected bit is going only to one bit position and therefore you get a long diffusion trail where only a single bit is getting affected and therefore the number of s boxes which are getting affected because of this is pretty less and that essentially i would say is a weakness of this design you cannot really take this s box and put it with a diffusion layer which is like a bit permutation and therefore, right, we need to still understand about, so while both of them are fine, the S box is, looks optimal, the bit permutations are also well constructed, but they are not a good fit for each other. Okay, so therefore the question is, how do we design the diffusion layer for this S box? 
So for this part, I will rather you know like uh, request you to you know like come again back to my talk on October three, where I will be talking about the other part of this uh, you know like or I would say that the missing piece uh, of the of this cipher construction. So I will stop here and uh, rather take any questions at this point. I think I've already shot my time. Oh, thank you so much, Professor. It was indeed a best uh, talk. And uh, we will be definitely looking for this missing uh, piece in the coming sessions. So audience, please, uh, there is one raise uh, hand. So yeah. So we will uh, get uh, Naidu on uh, the stage, Professor. Sorry. Maybe I'll just discard this. Hello. Hello. Yes. So uh, I think he. Professor Naidu, can you raise your hand or ask the question in the question tab? So any questions from the audience? You can directly uh, talk to Professor Devdeep. If you raise the hand, we will get you on the stage. So please uh, ask your queries or, you know, so, Professor, I would like to ask about uh, this lightweight cipher. I have a cryptanalysis background, not much into the cipher design. Uh, I would like to ask, like, if I am designing a particular uh, lightweight cipher, how will I get the gate count? Gate yes. equals count. Right. So, uh, I mean, the best way to do is, of course, to do the design. Like, it's, you know, like uh, doing the design means, like, uh, typically, I would say that uh, write a very long uh, code for for doing the you know like uh, for for your sbox for example and then run it through at least an you know like a design tool like an fpga design tool which is given by say xilinx or so but there is also a thumb rule that you can try to use which i try to kind of uh, mention here in my talk that suppose you take an sbox and you know like you take two sboxes you try to find out the number of cubic terms, the number of quadratic terms, and number of the linear terms. Okay, so and that will give you at least some estimate about at least which one is relatively costlier compared to the other. Okay, okay. I mean uh, because one thing is very important that it's very difficult to get an exact gate equivalent because of the various optimizations that your synthesizer may do. Okay, and uh, that will you will not really get an accurate estimate, but at least it can give you some rough idea about how complex or how easy your design is. Okay, so uh, normally when yeah. we uh, when I've uh, seen the paper there, they have mentioned this gate equivalent always, right. Right. and uh, sometimes you know they uh, like how much power. But gate equivalent was the major thing, and is uh, for the right. lightweight, it is always should be between okay. two thousand to three thousand. So right. I was, so the so gate, the, was, the, the gate equivalent is typically done by running your design through a uh, you know like the synthesis tool, which gives you a rough estimate of the number of two two input NAND gates. Which your design will take. Okay. Asa, can you stop sharing your screen, please? Okay, sure. So, there is a question. Can we get online tool for side channel attack? Uh, uh, well, I mean, uh, I don't think that there are any online tools for doing side channel attacks. Uh, but one thing which I can say always is that uh, you can actually build one such kind of tool in the sense of uh, you can see that many of these attacks, at least to understand your attacks, you do not really need to get the exact power consumptions, but you can try to kind of simulate the power consumptions by using a model like Hamming weight or Hamming distance. So, you know, after that, it are, it are just statistical techniques. So you can try to write your own programs for doing so. So, so uh, yes, I mean, I do not see that there are any, you know, like a, uh, like uh, online tool for doing side chain attacks where you can get something from the cloud kind of service. Yeah. Okay. So somebody has raised a hand. So I'm going to invite Dr. Yeah. Chakravarti on the stage. Uh, I see Dr. Chakravarti probably, right? So yeah, yeah. So should I click that? Uh, no, I have already provided him the access. Uh, he should be on the stage in a moment. Okay. So there are a couple of questions. What will be the minimum computation resource need needed for lightweight ciphers? Yeah. So uh, I would say that the 
best way to do that is to compete with lightweight ciphers like uh, like gift for example so gift is a very lightweight present uh, lightweight present and uh, it's a lightweight version of the block cipher present so if you see the uh, figures that i had with present uh, they are they are the computer they are some competitive numbers so if you design a lighter weight block cipher then you should have a design which is at least lighter compared to that okay. uh, welcome dr <coughs> shakar hello uh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, yes i can hear you. thank you okay uh, this has been a very good talk i uh, guess uh, some of the very good uh, knowledge about that lighter cryptography and crypto analysis so actually that question was from my side can we get online tool for site generator and you already answered this and sir what will be our which algorithm will our the base because uh, you have uh, given so many algorithm so this will be our base for starting our uh, work um, starting our design yeah so as i said that we can actually you know like uh, there are three approaches that we can take so i would say that you can for example take one of these nice lightweight block ciphers and you can try to tweak it so that it becomes lighter weight so for example uh, as i was mentioning that recently uh, some of the most well analyzed ciphers is gift okay so gift is a uh, paper that was published by as a follow up to present so you can take that and you can try to tweak it so that it becomes even lighter weight which is really a challenging job itself uh or you can try to make you know like a design up front from the scratch okay so as i tried to show you that approach using cello automata so that was an approach where we were trying to build a cipher from the scratch actually okay so uh, my objective was based on this observation that you when you take about present for example or gift or this class of s boxes each of the boolean functions in s boxes are distinct and therefore you cannot really serialize it right because you anyway need to have different boolean functions for all of them so you cannot serialize inside the s box but this approach that we were talking about we we try to kind of you know like achieve that that you can take the, the same rule and you can you know iterate it so that you have got uh, you know like an overall security but at the same time a lesser footprint on area Okay sir thank you very much thank you so uh, no question from my side okay thanks you so there are some more questions i think uh, uh which says that lightweight implementation should focus on fpg or asic since you mentioned that the same algorithm can have completely different results on fpg and asic okay so it's a very good question i mean uh, frankly speaking i uh, you know like i would say that fpgs are there with all of us at least you know like most of us can do fpga designs so it's a quick prototype of your design okay but uh, on the other hand if you have got the the tools to do an asic design then uh, that is typically also you know i would say more popular because most of the lightweight like block ciphers which are proposed are actually built on on assumption that you have got access to an asic library so but at the same time doing a complete end to end tape out on asics is also requires you know like not only uh, not only funds but also at the same time skill sets to do asic designs so as a starting point i would say that fpgs would be a good starting point because at least you will have some validation of your design yes there will be some challenges as well and that's why i refer to you like couple of papers one which was written by thoma perin and one which was written from our group also which tries to talk about what are the nuances of designing Uh, asics on fpgs compared to as uh, compared to asics i mean designing block ciphers and uh, there is another uh, question which asks about uh, could you explain more details regarding the branch count so actually i mentioned about branch number so so branch number typically means that uh, it tries to give you the minimum suppose you know like there is so the so the branch number is typically de defined with respect to a permutation So suppose you have got an input x and you would define a permutation on that say call it as phi of x then the branch number is defined with respect to that permutation okay so branch number means that the minimum number of so suppose you are uh, you know so the simplest way of understanding branch number is probably you make a disturbance in the input 
and you try to see how many output points get disturbed or how many output say output bits get disturbed okay so branch number gives you a minimum quantification of the number of disturbed uh, bits at the input plus the number of disturbed bits at the output so if the branch, if the branch number is high then that means you know like uh, there are more disturbances if you count the number in the inputs as well as the outputs so when i say you that the branch number of an s box a 4 plus 4 s box is say 2 okay so that means that suppose i am uh, making say one of the bits uh, you know like disturbed then if the since the minimum branch the minimum value is 2 then that means that there would be some cases where in the output there is only one bit gets affected right because the branch number is 2 but if the branch number was say for example 3 then that means when you are making one input bit disturbed then in the output there will be at least two bits getting disturbed okay but in the s box that i showed to you there is a weakness the weakness is it has got a branch number of two okay but if you compare it with, with a maybe uh, uh, the present s box for example it will have a branch number of two that uh, will have a branch number of three that means if you affect one input bit then at least in the output there will be two output, two affected okay and that's why there is a, there is more diffusion uh, in the cipher okay so therefore right we will see in the next part of the talk that how we can have a suitable diffusion layer even using such kind of uh, s boxes great so there are a couple of questions in the question tab if you can uh, click on it so i was speaking okay, the, okay i can see that uh, so the first question was uh, from Shikant, which says that IoT devices has less computation resources. Can we push these techniques on the edge devices? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, the, the proposal that I was trying to build up was for extremely resource constrained environments. And that is why I said that I am a very, you know, like uh, I, I advocate, you know, like the use of serialized architecture where you have got a very simple architecture and you try to again and again apply it to get the overall uh, computation. I mean, the overall computational security. Then there is another question on what will be the minimum computation resource needed for lightweight ciphers. Okay, so this, there are no hard and fast answers to this. It actually depends upon the, uh, you know, like the, the platform that you would like to implement, for example, uh, and it can be various, although we talk about, uh, you know, like the edge devices, but there are various kinds of edge devices, right? It could be maybe a USB endpoint, uh, it could be maybe an, you know, like an IoT, uh, as I said, you know, like a uh, IoT switch. Okay, so depending upon the, you know, like the environment, that will vary. But I would say that if you, since at this point, if you are concentrating on developing a cipher, then the best thing to do is to see the literature, okay, to see like what is the footprint of existing literature, like for example, a present, gift, piccolo, and so on, and try to see that whether the cipher that you make is competitive with those designs. okay great so uh, there are one more there is one more question i can't see that uh is that, where is it is it in the chat box should, oh, the, should light the lightweight uh, implementation be uh, okay so should the lightweight implementation be focused on a particular application of iot device or on a broader basis of iot devices so i think at this point, I mean, I mean, if you are starting, then the best thing to do is to make a good lightweight block cipher. But your focus should be on, you know, like its cryptic strength, and also on the cost that you would probably need to add side channel countermeasures. As I said, that you know, like present is a nice lightweight block cipher, but reports show that if you really want to have higher order side channel uh, guarantees, then it becomes, it can become even worse than AES, okay? And that is something that you do not really want because at some point of time, there is a very high chance that you will need to have, you know, like side channel uh, security. And if you end up, you know, like doing a design which is worse in that case, then that is also not desirable. So right now, I think your focus should be more on, 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 on the background, like on, you know, like the classical strength as well as the side channel strength and try to make a good design in that regard. And then there is another question on are there some properties of SBOX which are required to be tested while designing them so that it may resist uh, side channel attacks. Okay. So there were some uh, properties that we were trying to build. So which is called as, uh, and you can see that, uh, it is called as transparency order of the SBOX. Okay. So the transparency order of the SBOX is, um, and we try to kind of modify it to something which is called as a modified transparency order. It's a kind of metric which tries to give you some kind of 
evaluation of its side channel resistance okay but having said that we found out that all s boxes need uh, you know like uh, side channel protections and therefore right uh, it is all not only important to quantify the resistance of the s box against side channel but it is also important to quantify its uh, requirement of the countermeasure because you need to have a countermeasure you cannot avoid that so there is another question which says uh, does competition specify any bounds in terms of so this is actually uh, maybe a question which uh, would be taken by the competition uh, uh, you know yes, like so we rules. have not uh, specified yet but yeah. uh, we will soon update on this after right. discussing with the steering committee mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. uh, we will let you know so we sure. will update there is one more question are there so how do i calculate the exact gate equivalence i think this question was uh, discussed before so yeah. if you really want to calculate the gate equivalence then the best thing to do is to uh, have some kind of access to a vlsi design tool so and you uh, and the easiest would be to at least have got an fpga design tool and uh, try to write your design in maybe a very log kind of uh, language or Verilog or VHDL and try to compile and see that how many gates are required. That's the best thing to do. Sir, what about this synopsis? Uh... Synopsis is great. I mean, I'm just saying because it's from the cost point of view, but if somebody can afford synopsis, then synopsis or cadence, then definitely they are one of the best tools. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, any question, audience, uh, you wanted to? So I think there is one more question. Okay, so I see that there are a couple of questions. So first one is, um, uh, okay, so is, should the lightweight implement uh, lightweight implementation be focused on a particular application of? I think this was already discussed. Probably. Yes, yes, sir. yeah, yeah. There are some properties of Xbox which require tested. Yeah, this, this is also. also discussed, yes. uh, this is general question. Deep learning has become a new tool for analysis of the cipher. Unlike traditional analysis technique, there where the rules could be developed ensure good design, DL itself is a black box. How so? How well would current best? Okay, <clears throat> so uh, so the question is on deep learning. So unlike traditional analysis techniques where rules could be developed ensure good design, DL itself is a black box. So how well would current best? So not that I really understand the question properly, but uh, what I uh, understand, uh, probably you are asking about the usage of deep learning for evaluating uh, Cypher, like in terms of both his cryptanalytic strength as well as uh, the side channel protection. So well, I mean, I will first uh, talk about rather the side channel aspect because that is the area that I work on. There are some, you know, like uh, very interesting works on how you can apply deep learning for side channel evaluation and likewise there are also applications of deep learning for building cryptanalytic tools so i mean uh, i mean these tools are so i would just say that uh, as far as i understand um, deep learning has got this wonderful ability of uh, you know like uh, comprehending the various features in your input and sometimes those features can be utilized for developing your security evaluation tool for example that is what we have seen in the context of power attack or fault attack evaluations deep learning works pretty nicely to understand uh, those features in less number of observations so thank you professor it is a, indeed a great talk and we will be looking forward for the um, uh, more talks in the lightweight cryptographic channel and uh, otherwise also so uh, I would like to just tell audience, please send your questions separately. Uh, I'll forward them to professor and you will get your answers. Uh, and uh, about the lightweight uh, cipher design cha challenge, the competition is already open. You can register. The last date for the application will be December 5th. Uh, you can uh, attend the webinars and uh, the workshops by the eminent uh, faculties uh, so that you will get a good idea about the lightweight uh, ciphers. And uh, I would like to thank Professor for joining this session and giving this wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your attention. Bye.